Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in our virtual town hall series, Confronting COVID-19, Keeping Business Running in the Dallas Region. This is one of the many ways we are keeping you informed and engaged as we navigate this evolving crisis together. My name is Drexel Owusu, and I lead our education and workforce efforts at the Dallas Regional Chamber. We're so pleased today to have with us the Texas Commissioner of Education, Mike Morath. Commissioner Morath, a former Dallas ISD trustee and a DRC Leadership Dallas alum, was appointed to his post by Governor Greg Abbott in 2016. As commissioner, he heads the Texas Education Agency, which oversees pre-K through high school education for more than 5 million students enrolled in both public schools and charter schools. He has worked to focus the state agency on his four priorities, including recruiting, supporting, and retaining teachers and principals, building a foundation of math and reading, connecting high school to career and college, and improving low-performing schools. Thank you for being with us today, Commissioner. Thanks for having me. Uh, so to jump right in, uh, I'm sure it has been an exciting time for you uh, down in Austin. Can you please share with us a little bit about the last couple of weeks uh, for you and your team? Uh, well, the last uh, couple of weeks have been atypical uh, for me and my team. Um, uh, it has been actually 15 days uh, today since the first uh, closure announcement, school closure announcement happened in Texas. Um, and with the uh, uh, onset of COVID-19, in our major metropolitan areas and now spreading um, I think the last count is 85 counties in the state of Texas and climbing. Um, it's been a massive operational disruption to public education for the enterprise. We have 8,600 schools, five and a half million kids, 700,000 employees, and everything is different today than it was two weeks ago. Um, what um, we have tried to do at the agency is um, I would say two different um, but critical uh, activities. One uh, was something analogous to what we did um, uh, during Hurricane Harvey. Who knew that Hurricane Harvey would actually just be preparation for the real disaster? Um, so what we uh, have stood up as a very rapid response team to, to discern appropriate steps to deregulate, uh, to keep funding flowing, to provide um, guidance related to, to waivers here and the through operational adjustments that are necessary just from the regulatory function of the agency um, to give local leaders the flexibility they need to respond um, how, how best they can respond in their local community. But uh, far beyond what we have done, we did with Hurricane Harvey, what we have also tried to do is stand up uh, as, as extensively as possible technical assistance to our school system leaders who are uh, grappling with really tremendous challenges. So, for example, uh, 15 days ago, uh, uh, days ago, I started a daily superintendent briefing call. Um, there were 100 superintendents on the first one, I think eight or 900 superintendents on the second one. Um, uh, yesterday, we had, we had 1,500 people on it, so more than just superintendents. Um, and we're running the gamut of um, things to consider. So, we have, uh, talked about logistical considerations to how to mitigate public health risk when you are getting homework back from parents. Um, we, uh, we're, we, we talk about how to stand up distance learning um, resources, whether it's sort of high tech or low tech. Um, and um, what, we're at, what we've done is we've actually uh, uh, formed a task force, about a, a 50 member strong external task force with 50 um, internal team members on instructional continuity. So that um, if Garland, for example, creates a very innovative um, approach to at-home learning um, in elementary mathematics, then we immediately share that with uh, all 1,200 school system leaders in the state of Texas. So it's, it, what we've we've tried to do uh, again, is set up this um, apparatus that allows for every great idea that is getting surfaced in Texas, and there are a lot of great ideas getting surfaced. In those uh, to be spread far and wide as rapidly as possible. We are essentially having to, and what we've had to do is create this operational in less than two weeks to do at-home instructional support for five and a half million kids. Um, and that is a massive operation. Um, 
Um, and so we're we're just um, trying to create a, a framework that would allow for very rapid iterations. Um, uh, so people try things, they don't work. People try things, they do work, and just spread that as rapidly as possible. And and that's not just on the instructional side of the house. That's also on the operational side of the house. So we're at I think fifteen hundred meal service sites and counting that have been stood up in the last uh, week or so for parents to drop off, or I'm sorry, to pick up. Uh, breakfast and lunch. In fact, a large number of districts are actually launching home delivery options, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the Texas Department of Agriculture has set up some support to do that um, extensively in rural Texas. So this is, um, um, you know, this is essentially what we have done. So I have uh, uh, daily meetings um, at, at nine o'clock with all of my staff remotely um, about. Uh, 50 members of my leadership team on um, on the sort of the issues of the day. So we're just rapidly um, set up a sort of crisis response nerve center, both for immediate response and um, longer term action planning, because we are going to have to get back to school. Um, uh, and so we're also sort of engaging in planning for to get back to school in a more traditional fashion whenever the, the public health situation would allow it. Thank you for that. The uh, as I, I'm listening to my son in the other room practice his band assignment. So if you hear any background noise, uh, I apologize. He's getting better. Um, but can you give us a sense for how this distance learning experiment is going? Right, we weren't expecting to have to do it, and now here we are, five and a half million. Times. Yeah. So I mean, I have I have four young kids. The the twins are 20 months of age, and um, and. And then I've got a pre-K kid and a first grader uh, in public school uh, down in Austin, and uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a significant shift for uh, me and all the other parents in the state of Texas um, who are now uh, doing at home um, at home school um, uh, in uh, with the support of uh, of our teachers um, uh, from the school system. So. There's there's varying responses. Um, uh, you know, different school districts entered this crisis with um, different experiences in supporting at home learning for their kids. So some districts, um, it's been really this explosion of innovation that they had been iterating on in a smaller scale, and now they're just deploying it um, system wide. And it's remarkable. You're seeing 97, 98% participation in um, online learning. They've um, Some of these districts have deployed uh, Wi-Fi and and internet access for their low-income families. Um, uh, teachers are engaging with their uh, their kids. The teachers are actually still with the kids, and they're doing it longer than they did uh, in the traditional school day because they're um, uh, you know there's no more you know you don't have to commute to school anymore. So I mean it's it's um, so there's there's uh, some action that is really amazingly positive and quite possibly better than uh, the caliber of instruction that's happening. Before. Um, and then there's the other end of the spectrum, which are districts that are really struggling with how to best support kids that are at home. Um, again, whether it's a sort of a low tech or a high tech um, kind of support apparatus um, and everything in between. So um, we are um, again, one of the, the goals of our of our technical assistance work that we have stood up is to try to um, rapidly help raise all boats. Um, all over the state of Texas in terms of how this instructional response is going. But there's, I mean, there's so many little things. Uh, it should should you give guidance to parents about establishing a basic routine, a daily schedule? So the answer is yes, by the way. Um, and um, and so what could those schedules? So we've we've actually published some sample schedules to communicate to parents. Eight thirty rolls around, eat breakfast, um, I, I, you know, try to try to t um, uh, talk and have some engaging conversation. Um, a walk around outside, uh, maintaining six feet of distance between all fellow humans uh, while you're doing that. Um, uh, but then maybe have a block that you're focused on academic instructional time. And then there's teacher hours that they're going to, they, you know, have, have established that I'm actually going to call the house or I'm going to chime in online at this time just to check on you. So, I mean, um, all this, these kinds of little details, big details, we're trying to be sensitive to all those to get all the districts the support they need to. to properly support everybody consistently. Well, that sort of leads to the next question. So 
What's the current thinking or expectation for if or when schools might open again or if they will at all? Well, so it's a, I'd say it's a rapidly changing fact base. We're learning more about the, uh, the virus on a daily basis. We're learning more about the public health situation on a daily basis. Um, um, uh, we at TEA, the governor, uh, and his broader team, our, our partners over at the state health services, um, regular coordination with CDC and local officials all over the state of Texas. We're trying to synthesize intelligence, basically. This is a, a rapidly evolving situation um, and make the best decisions uh, uh, informed by the best public health information possible. Um, I don't. I think the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, we, don't, we don't know if we'll be back in business um, uh, in some uh, portions of the state even this school year, which I think is a possibility that, that there, and there may be schools that um, are able to reopen in a more traditional um, way, um, even this school year. I think that's, that's at least um, in the realm of possibility, but there are others where they may be um, closed for the duration of the school year. We, we, we don't fully uh, know yet. Um, this also impacts planning for how to return um, to, the, to the traditional um, instructional setting. But I will we'll also say is, and I don't know if this is one of the, one of your questions or not, but the, um, uh, we are also thinking very seriously about academic gaps, uh, how to diagnose them and support them, um, because we do anticipate that um, the, um, our normal work in public education to try to, um, to resolve um, and ameliorate achievement gaps is only being exacerbated in the, in the current context. And um, when you remove the uh, end of year state assessment, um, while there's um, you know, generally a lot of hot sports opinions on that, what that really means is you are removing a huge amount of diagnosis um, on uh, student educational readiness. And we find ourselves in this grand public health crisis where what we're trying to do is rapidly expand our public health diagnostic capacity because we identify that as a critical need for the public health response, but we have eliminated a significant educational diagnostic um, lever. Um, uh, and we had to, because how else would we have implemented it? But um, uh, uh, don't expect anything good to come from that. What we have to do is ensure that we have good educational diagnostic um, approaches um, that, are, that are ready to be stood up and support um, uh, educators so, so they can find out exactly what the kids know and can do, and what they have not yet mastered. So that they can intervene and remediate accordingly uh, when we resume resume our normal um, uh, educational posture. Thank you for that. And and, and it was going to be a question that I was going to ask in more more detail, which is, um, you know, as you guys think about these academic gaps um, that are created because of the circumstance we find ourselves, you know, how how do we make up for this time? Um, you know, are, we, are there discussions afoot that we need to be looking at changes in the school year? Are there discussions afoot um, about, uh, you know, how we assess where they stand? And, and, and I think it would be useful for our audience, if nothing else, to have some better insight around that. Yeah, one thing that we're talking about is how we ensure all districts have, uh, again, as I mentioned before, good um, educational diagnostics. Um, start of the next school year so they can identify um, you know this this kid was able to you know uh, master their addition and subtraction tables but they still haven't mastered their times tables and division tables for example or um, uh, this student's um, you know vocabulary is a little weak in this area we, we know we need to short up that this kind of um, information um, is, is critical to the to the art and science of teaching you know, teaching without assessing for mastery is not teaching it's it's just talking. So we need to make sure that we, um, we uh, uh, cr craft that and support our districts with that kind of capacity. But the, uh, the, the other thing, as you mentioned, is just time. The, how sh can we redesign the curricular experience next year? So maybe the first six weeks is an intensive effort to shore up any gaps uh, to, to get the, the last portion of the school year compressed um, in um, and, and uh, and get as many kids to mastery on those concepts as possible. We're, you know, we're gonna have kids that are rising to fourth grade this year, or next year, that um, may not um, really have demonstrated the kind of proficiency they need even in third grade uh, content. So 
um, you know, uh, trying to help uh, and, and ensure that we're prepared to kind of um, reorient the curricular systems for the next school year, even expanding time um, that is um, that is made available. These are things that we're talking to key district leaders around the state with. We're sort of uh, wrestling with that um, uh, internally in terms of what tools we'll have at our disposal um, to help districts um, really address that that compelling educational need. So, sort of keeping on the same subject, what about for our, our state seniors, right? So, for, for kids who are graduating high school this year, who, who, who don't get to quote unquote go back, um, the, uh, you know, how do we, how do we help make sure that they're fully ready for the next step, right? Whether that's a post secondary or, a, you know, a place, place in the workforce. Um, the uh, how are, how are we kind of creating the right mechanisms or tools to make sure that those kids can hit the ground running? Yeah, we've tried to answer as many of these questions as possible for our uh, district leaders. Again, I'm um, doing these daily briefing calls with districts. We're fielding north of 100, 150 questions a day from school leaders, uh, school system leaders. And we actually have established a kind of nerve center of answers to this. If you're interested, it's at tea.texas.gov slash coronavirus. Um, that's, uh, again, designed for school system leaders. Um, uh, uh, so you'll see all the arcane educational terminology that uh, only school leaders uh, love and appreciate. But um, uh, so there, this question about um, our, our seniors is, um, is, a pretty, is a pretty big one. So we have several different sets of resources related to that. Um, one, we're, we, you know, I think we have to collectively recognize we're not relaxing expectations. We expect our students um, to master the, um, the, the curricular um, expectations of their senior year. Um, uh, so, uh, so that is out there. This is the reason why um, creating continuity of instruction to make sure that we continue to support them educationally during this time is pretty critical. Um, that being said, we have had to uh, waive and create some more flexibility um, for the termination of who graduates. So there may be some students, for example, that uh, didn't pass in the EOC last year that were um, in a, in a uh, class this year in order to try to, to, to take it here in the, in the spring, and they won't be able to do that. So we have a, a process called an individual graduation committee where you can look at other aspects of student work. There's a portfolio a student can do to demonstrate that they've um, reached that proficiency. Um, our approach is to measure college readiness, and this is really relevant for folks that are, you know, going into college because those college entrance exams matter. So we're, we're, we're working with um, those um, people like the SAT, the ACT, and the like, to make sure that there's the ability for kids to take those uh, exams either remotely or in the summer um, uh, and, um, and work to support districts accordingly. The other thing I, I've talked to our superintendents about is for many of us, like, the normal graduation ceremonies not going to happen because um, it just depends on where we are from a public health perspective. So there's a lot of operational uh, adjustments that um, we're, we need to, to um, support for our graduating seniors while, again, uh, maintaining high expectations that they are, in fact, um, you know, um, they, they've earned a high school diploma and are ready for the next phase in life. The so I'm going to pivot on you for just a second um, and, and ask a question about uh, pre-K. So we're going from the seniors, now we're going to the babies. Um, but, you know, can you talk a little bit about the role that TEA is playing in addressing the child care issues that we're starting to see pop up, um, particularly for our essential workers, um, given that a lot of our public school pre-K centers are closed? Yeah, so we have... Um, uh... There is a specific exception um, uh, for child care related public health. So I, I, I'll put this in a slightly different category than pre-K. Um, but you can imagine um, uh, our folks that are working in hospitals and other critical care settings, um, they are in uh, pretty soon going to be doing 12, 14, 24 hour shifts. Um, and for those that are parents um, with young children, um, what happens to their kids? So. We have um, asked our school system leaders all over the state of Texas to coordinate with their local healthcare system leaders. Um, uh, so to the extent that they have a school site that is located relatively close to um, a, a hospital or other uh, critical care facility, um, that they um, try to help um, utilize that school site um, 
for um, supporting the, the children of those healthcare workers while they're while they're doing their shifts. So um, uh, Galveston ISD, for example, yesterday, today, no, two days ago, stood up an infant toddler uh, care um, operation in one of their elementary schools, and uh, that was two days ago. And then yesterday, they stood up a, a preschool to ten year old care uh, facility uh, in one of their other schools with hundreds of hundreds of, of little kiddos uh, in it now. So um, there's a lot of our school leaders that are really stepping up, not just to educate the kids that they have that are that are working from home, but to step up and um, augment our healthcare capacity and, and healthcare system. I think I mean, we collectively should be very, very proud of our school system leaders for what they're doing, not just to continue and expand an education, but what they're doing to help our communities also in this time of crisis. Thanks for, for sharing that. The, uh, the, as the child of an educator and now finding myself struggling, I'll choose to use uh, to uh, educate my children uh, from home. Um, you know, what are the best ways for us as a business community in particular to support our teachers during this extraordinary time? Uh, well, I mean, it, the, that's a great question. I mean, our, our, our teachers need our love and support um, all the time, not just during this time. Um, but uh, it's, you know, I'm, um, I'm sure you're experiencing that the, there's a, this is a pretty disruption, a pretty big disruption to our normal life. So, um, so for teachers that you know individually, I think it's you know, useful just to reach out to them. Um, uh, commiserate um, the I think more more appropriately sort of broad business um, uh, engagement is is to work in support of our school system and our leaders uh, because each school system has sort of different needs Dallas for example is working on this very uh, broad based uh, uh, wireless hotspot deployment for kids who don't have internet access at home um, and there's uh, there's a lot of uh, individual tangible activities that, uh, that certain businesses can play and uh, helping support that. I think, you know, businesses, we're, we're employers. Um, so our employees are parents, um, uh, many of them. Uh, they're gonna need some like uh, adjustments and extra help. Um, I have the uh, good fortune, you know, my wife is a doctor, but since we moved down to uh, Austin, she has not practiced. She's stayed at home um, with our kids. So between the two of us, by the way, she's got the vastly more difficult job. Um, uh, but um, I mean, we're very blessed to be in a situation where uh, my wife has the luxury of staying at home. Um, there's a lot of families that don't have that luxury. And so I think employers need to be very sensitive to that during, during this time as to like, how can they make adjustments um, for employees who are uh, parents um, who are going to have to make sure their kids are at home safe and, and continue to make uh, educational progress. And that that's um, Depending upon the age of your kids, that's a different challenge for like a five year old than it is for a 10 year old than it is for a 15 year old. And I think the difficulty level is like high for five, lower for 10, and then it goes back up again for 15. So anyways, the, um, you know, I think employers need to be sensitive to that in terms of how they're um, how they're adjusting. I, I, I agree. I think a, a bit of grace is due, due all in this circumstance. Um, all right. So la last question, uh, last scripted question. Um, but obviously you've got ties to the Dallas area. You graduated from Garland. Uh, you were a trustee here in Dallas. Um, you know, how do you feel the Dallas area school districts? Obviously our largest one being Dallas ISD, um, but we've got lots of great school districts and, and charter systems up here. Um, you know, how do you think they're doing now? And, you know, what do you think the landscape will look like in a few months um, when we hopefully get through this? Well, I mean, folks in Dallas County are blessed with an embarrassment of riches in terms of the quality of your leaders. You've got, uh, I mean, I'm going to leave people out here, but you've got Jeannie Stone and Richardson and Rick Lopez. You, of course, Dr. Hinojosa, who is uh, who's a, um, a prince among men, uh, DeAndre Weaver, um, Magda Hernandez, um, Yasmin Abati at Uplift. I mean, you've, you've got, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm leaving folks out, but I mean, you've got um, tremendously talented school system leaders um, in the backyard. Um, and these folks are struggling um, mightily uh, to address every new issue that comes to them. And there's new issues that are coming to them on an hourly basis. 
Um, so, um, I mean, I, I think um, the, the, the kinds of adjustments that those school systems are making to support uh, learning at home, um, they're making very rapid adjustments. Um, uh, but we also just need to all recognize, even though, uh, again, you've got some tremendously strong um, and talented leaders in your backyard, the, the, um, this is a big operational adjustment. Um, and people are, people are um, you know, pivoting um, more rapidly than we've ever pivoted before in public education uh, uh, and making these um, significant changes in how we deliver educational support. So I, I, you mentioned it earlier, but I think we, we all need to recognize that this is a good time for grace and love uh, and compassion and understanding and patience um, uh, while we, um, we make this adjustment. We are, we are all in this together uh, and everybody is uh, doing their best to, to support each other. So it's just, um, it's, it's, a, it's a trying time for all of us. So you pointed, you mentioned that there are some resources that TEA has made available for parents and others. Are they all on the coronavirus site or section of your website or resources or other places we should? Yeah. To, to be clear, the resources that we have stood up are predominantly for school system leaders. Now we do have, we have launched a meal finder. Um, now this is definitely for parents. So if you go to texasschools.gov, um, if you're a parent uh, of a public school kid and uh, you're eligible for a free reduced lunch, this is, will tell you exactly where you can go to pick up. Uh, lunch and in, uh, in some cases breakfast for your kids. We'll make sure that the flow of um, food to our school children is is uninterrupted during this um, uh, time of crisis. Our school districts have um, have launched all that, and we have uh, created a just a central repository of all that information. It's a map you can type in your address. It tells you what the closest location is. That's at TexasSchools.gov. Well, great. Well, are there any final kind of words you want to leave uh, our, our audience or group with um, as you continue to uh, fight on behalf of all our Texas students? Um, no, I mean, I, it's, I don't know that I can I don't know if I can make grand words of wisdom for you. I mean, we, um, I do this work. I'll tell you, I do feel blessed because every day I get to wake up, um, and I have a job that allows me concentrate all my time and thinking about how to help five and a half million kids. It is, um, it is a phenomenal um, opportunity, but I do this work because I love kids. Our educators do this work because they love kids. Um, uh, we are all struggling mightily at this time, uh, but we are, we are all in this together and everybody's doing what they can uh, to support each other. And it's, this is, this is great. This is what you expect to see in Texas as Texans helping Texans. Well, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for uh, the support you're providing uh, and, and stewardship you're providing on behalf of our five and a half million students. Um, we, uh, we appreciate you greatly uh, and we appreciate your time today. Uh, a special thank you again to Commissioner Mike Morath for being with us and sharing his thoughts and insights and perspectives with our members and our community. Please visit DallasChamber.org for the latest COVID-19 news and resources, and we'll make sure you get connected to all of the resources that Commissioner Morath laid out. Thank you. Mm -hmm.